you. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for your time. No, no, thank you. Well, all right. So we'll start three, two, and one. So, uh, sir, I, I have a, a, an important question I got to get off my chest. I, I have to know this. What's the hardest part of your career? Um, having to remind Jenny McCarthy constantly that Drake is not in the bedazzled chicken outfit or making Joe McHale seem likable on television. <laughs> um, neither. The hardest part is me just trying to find um, a, a sufficient guess for anything on The Masked Singer. And then, um, and the second hardest thing is you know, kind of managing my own personal emotions while having Joel McHale as a mercy booking. So, you know, they, <laughs> they, they, there are there are challenges in thereof. <laughs> so, like, I, I'm guessing Joel, like, you know, blows you up on the phone through text at least a couple times a week going, dude, bro, can you get me on the show? Because he's got, what, nothing going on? He's like, he's very polite on the phone and very like, you know, normal and just a decent man, decent family man. Like, oh my gosh, I'd be, I'd be honored to go on the show. Thanks. And then you get the and action. Blah, 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 blah. I get sandbag every time. Maybe it's the, maybe it's me like falling for it. It's like, he's Lucy with the football and I just fall for it. And I just, I just trip up and fall down. Oh, Joel. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I could listen to you two bicker for hours because I think it's hysterical and I Thank am, a, I am team, I am team Ken all the way, but Thank I do. You. That's more important. Thank you. Oh, of course. I got, I got the t-shirt right here. It says team Ken and it has a picture of you <laughs> as Mr. Chow. Understood. Understood. I, I, I know the screen cuts it off, but I hundred percent trust. Well, that you know, I gotta, I gotta protect my gut from being on the screen. <laughs> you don't want to see this, Ken. <laughs> You know, I got the COVID-50, COVID-75 <laughs> going on, bro. Just, just keeping it real. Oh, my goodness. Love it. So now, I wonder, do you long for the days of when you were you know, participating and competing in the Mr. Buccaneer pageant? <laughs> oh, wow. That just That is like two lifetimes ago. It really, it was as you probably gathered was it was a moment where i i was performative for the first time in my career for the first time in my life ever and just kind of going with the flow and just kind of ad-libbing and just getting just getting a rise i call it my napoleon dynamite moment you just people were just giving me uh, unprompted standing ovations with every silly move I was doing. And I was not that kid in, in, in high school. I was not a class clown at all. So, so it, yeah, definitely informed me. And here we are. Yeah. So now, just for those who don't know what I was referring to, and yes, I did a yes. ton of research on you. Um, I, not to freak you out, but we did some research. <laughs> um, the, can you tell people about this pageant I was referring to and uh, Absolutely. what we were talking about? Yeah, it was uh, in high school. There was a, a, a mock male beauty pageant called Mr. Buccaneer. Our mascot was the pirate, and they would select about 10 people um, to participate in this pageant every year. And I was um, I, I was a studious kid, but uh, but for some reason I was always I was a popular studious kid. And so um, I was chosen to participate in it, and I ended up um, uh, like playing this. Uh, I, yeah, I ended up like we did a swimsuit competition and and I ended up like uh, posing like Mr. Olympia, you know, and um, in swim trunks and just, you know, and I and I was I was competing against like the high school, you know, the star quarterback, the athletes, the real popular kids. And and I, but I was just so committed into believing I had the best body. And then then the, the crowd just went nuts. And then for the talent portion. I ended up playing on piano and singing three times a lady and I had never sang before and, uh, or, you know, like in public. And, um, I, pl I practiced piano, play piano a lot as a kid, but, uh, and that was my first time singing. And, uh, you know, I, I, people gave me another standing ovation. So uh, when I think of Mr. Buccaneer, I think of like, wow, this is the first time, um, you know, uh, that I, it must have planted the seed uh, when I went to college, like, you know, give acting a try, give comedy a try. So that's kind of what happened.
So it was the speedo that did you in. It was the it speedo. Was, I I do think um to be to be fair, I do think it was still just normal speed uh swim trunks. I think yeah, uh, the memory gets foggy, but um. So, but just to get a, but just to get a, a standing ovation with just, uh, you know, longer swim trunks still, you know, that, that takes some sort of uh, performative ability, I guess. I don't know. So, so how does, so how does one balance studying to be in the medical profession and comedy? I mean, it's like two ends of the spectrum. I mean, I don't know how you pulled it off. So oh, very poorly. It's very, it's very hard. <laughs> it's uh, it, cause when I was at, um, when I went to college at Duke, I was uh, pre-med and I was a zoology major, which is basically biology without the botany. And I was doing, um, I was taking organic chemistry, which is the hardest uh, prerequisite class. You know, two semesters of that in order to get into med school, you need good grades in organic chemistry uh, to get into medical school. But that's the time where I took an intro to acting class my sophomore year and I just fell in love. I just got immediately bitten by the bug. And just fell in love with acting. It was that moment there. And I ended up auditioning for um, our the drama school at Duke and got in. I got accepted. And um, and then, but then I was kind of stuck. I would, they're like, well, okay, now I, I got it. What do I do with it? And they're like, well, you know, do I, do I quit pre-med? And, and I remember the theater program was like, we think that you can do both. We think that you're talented and smart that you can do both at the same time. And I'm like, no, I'm not. So I had to, I had to really reluctantly and begrudgingly quit uh, or like uh, decline the Duke theater offer and just kind of repair my orgo grade, which had gone from an A to a C while I was doing all this musical theater and doing and doing plays. And it was an incredibly tough time in kind of my late teens, early 20s is just trying to kind of find my identity and figure out who I am. So it was... Uh, it was a balance. I, I honestly don't know how I did it. I think I just kind of willed myself to do now, it. Now, really. was there anybody at the improv that was helpful to you in your early part of your career? Someone that kind of yeah. gave you some good advice? I know that uh, Michael Che recently in an interview talked about how Tracy Morgan pulled him aside and was like, uh, you're doing it all wrong and kind of gave him sort of a push in the right direction. So I wonder if you had someone like that in the early part of your career. It was Bud Friedman. He was the founder of the Improv. He he was a judge of the he was one of the judges of the contest that I was in in New Orleans, and so he really took care of me in my early years. He he gave me a lot of stage time, and I'd go on the road, do some of his improv clubs, and even before I was ready. And so, um, you know, I don't think he gave me specific advice of what I'm doing wrong. I think I probably was doing everything wrong, and he was just kind of giving me the stage time to grow and just kind of learn for myself. And um, just to kind of figure it out on my own. But he gave me, he put me in a position to succeed. Absolutely. And uh, in those early days, yeah, I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for Bud Freeman. He got me into the Montreal uh, Just for Last Festival just uh, um, uh, way earlier than I should have been. So it, 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 he gave me a lot of opportunities. He pulled a lot of strings for me. So I'm um, very indebted to him. Well, I mean, I know that some of the comedians, uh, Pablo, et cetera, they've had these moments where like one of these, I will say some of them, one of the comedians on, on that Mount Rushmore, if you will, shows up and does a set at the improv on announce. Um, have you ever had that moment where someone oh, yeah. just showed up, showed up and, and you got bumped? And I was wondering who that might be. Um, I didn't get bumped, but I remember Adam Sandler showed up. This was like 1999, like um, it was like right after Big Daddy came out, you know, in the really? theaters. And yeah. there were a bunch of kids um, uh, there in the summer. I still remember it was a July, I think, 99, and Sandler just came in and did an unannounced set. And what I really respected about him, he didn't do like an hour. He didn't do – he just – he did a modest amount of time. It wasn't like gratuitous. And – he was so respectful to the other comedians like me who just oh, we got to give it. So we didn't get bumped. I but I had to That's follow great. him. I had to go up right after. You had him. to follow Sandler. I had to follow Sandler. How that and go? It it actually went well because the audience was so happy to have seen him. They had now they have something that for the rest of their lives they can see. I saw Adam Sandler live, you know, and right when his right when Big Daddy was coming out, and so. And I, I do remember doing a hacky impression of Sandler just to acknowledge his presence, and it got a laugh. And then I was able to do my act, and I didn't bomb that badly. 
you know it wasn't uh it was i'm sure it wasn't great but i don't it wasn't memorable by any means but it was much better than i thought and i remember that that actually gave me some confidence back in the day too with to follow the biggest comedy star at that time and then and then not completely blow it <laughs> it was uh it's 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 these baby stuff especially in LA and New York it's such a brutal uh it's a brutal competitive world in stand up <laughs> still is obviously now is it easier to be a judge or compete in the mass singer so much uh, easier to be a judge because so you've done judge. both you've done both I've done both yeah cuz in korea where i was promoting the mass singer uh in the u.s but i was in korea promoting this as a one-off and um it was stressful i was in a i flew to korea in secret really i didn't leave my hotel room and then i would wear a mask get into the limo and then get to the studio in korea and just wear a, a mask just a a covering and then i would go into this room where um like this like a dorm room where it was comfortable, but it was a room I was there for like seven hours and I was just rehearsing. And then the producers would come to my room and then we would go over the song. I did do a rehearsal in costume on stage, not knowing, knowing, knowing who I was. But the, it was I still remember it. It was very painful. It was very you know, stressful because I'm not a great singer. So it was it was really hard. And uh, and I'm like and that was early on in the Mass Singers run. So I'm kind of like, this is great because at least I have the perspective of how difficult it is to be a contestant. And um I think in the states it's even harder because some of the costumes are even heavier and it's a bit more challenging. So it's a it's a it's a very hard show to do, but very fulfilling on every every contestant I've talked to who are friends of mine who've been on the show. They they loved every they really loved every part of it. You know, you could you can tell like uh, they enjoyed every moment of it because uh, it's unlike anything that they've ever done. And um, and I'm glad I was able to do that and get on stage and, and appreciate like how uh, incredibly nerve wracking it is. Can I tell you why I think people are drawn to your show? I can see your voice if, if you don't mind. No, sure. I, I, I think it's, you know, on the surface, you look at it, it, it looks like it's sort of a typical, you know, game show, if you will. But really if, when you watch it, you get hooked because it's an uplifting show. I mean, it really is. It's uplifting. It's it's about you know showing off this talent. It's about you know giving these people their moment in the sun, whether they have the talent or not. I mean, it's it's and you've got these people with these stories that you're you know, hopefully they can win this money. It's it's an uplifting um, experience, Ken. And 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 I was wondering if that was the main motivation why you decided to even get into the show to begin with. First of all, for you to recognize what I think is the key to that show, it, just for you to know that and acknowledge that, that means more to me than you know. Uh, I Can See Your Voice is one of the most fulfilling projects I've ever done in my career, precisely because of what you just said. It's transformative where I remember back in the day they had um, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition. You have those kind of arc, yep. arc endings that are very inspiring. And there have been so many moments in that first season where um, I, I, let's say when the contestant won that game-changing money, um, won $100,000. And um, my favorite moment in the, in the first season when Pat Monahan was a musical guest and we had a contestant who had been not doing well throughout the entire game. And we have a deal or no deal aspect in the last act of the show where you you either, I think she was at twenty or 30000 and and you can either gamble and go all the way to 100000 for this round or but the but if the last if the secret voice standing is a bad singer then you you will you you you'll go to zero you lose all of all the money and uh she decided to go for it and she had not done very well and, and none of us were really that confident that she would win and uh and she was so emotional in making that decision she was like i you know i'm doing this for doing this for my daughter would love to get a the house, house. To, I've yeah. s i saw it yeah. Yeah, and, and and I was there, and throughout the whole show, she was very emotional, and uh, and uh, even after her second, even after the early rounds, she would start crying, and because she's like, I'm not going to win, I'm not going to win, you know. And there are moments. I think they even caught some of that as part of the B-roll on the on the final broadcast, where I literally was like, Are you okay? Are you okay? And she was like, I'm, you know. It was really, really emotional, and I didn't know whether she should go for the 100,000 given how a how emotional she was and b you know the chances of winning anything on these shows are, are remote and you just don't know and uh 
and everyone was just nervous as the it was a secret the secret voice was the chef had claimed to, uh to you know to have performed with a lot of uh established artists and you just don't know we had been bam we had been fooled many times and uh throughout that episode and pat i, I distinctly make pat money is a good friend of mine and he was just he was just kind of like stressed out performing and he starts doing his song and then there's like what seemed to be forever it probably was only like a 10 second pause but it seemed like 10 minutes waiting to see in the second verse if he was a good singer and he had the voice of an angel and i still i get choked up thinking about it right now and i remember Siley, the contestant just l crying and literally collapsing on the ground and it's it's one of the, those shows that are just stand out for how different it is, the message, the, the, the purpose. And I may not be a fan of a lot of game shows, but I'm a fan of yours because it sets itself apart and you're a big reason why. And I, 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 can, I, can, I can appreciate that. What I also can appreciate is that Netflix show, uh, special you did that was so fantastic uh, fairly recently um with a great title i mean if i don't know if you want to <laughs> plug that title again that always makes me laugh Go ahead. <laughs> that was that was my wife's idea because my wife's last name my wife's name's tran ho last name ho and uh that was um a classic punchline from from a, a joke in my uh, from a bit in my routine and and um it was actually my wife that came up with the title because i had come up with a, a another title that was a little bit more generic and it was actually Netflix that actually said, you know, maybe maybe something a little bit more catchy. And then I asked Tran, and she goes, "How about how about the punchline? You complete me, ho." And that was Tran. <laughs> so so it was actually um, I would never do these ho jokes without her approval. It wasn't like so. There's uh, and um, and that was John Chu's idea. He directed um, between Crazy Rich Asians in the Heights. He 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 took time to direct the special and. It was his idea to have Tran in the audience, and he would make that a focal point because that wasn't. I I would talk about her in my act, and I wanted, you know, but uh, that was her idea. That was his idea to make her, you know, um, you know, just visible, you know, in the special. So, um, it 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 was uh, again. It, I, I'm very very blessed to uh, have have just even a just even do a Netflix special is just a huge. A huge accomplishment but b just do something so personal and and to do something a little bit different and um and it was it was less jokey it was just more of and, and by design it was more autobiographical and you know you you it, to me it was a love letter to tran it wasn't really a stand-up special more as of um uh, just you know just a love letter to my wife and it was just uh and it's a nice little uh it's a nice little uh, uh, like time capsule looking back. You know, I think a lot of things I do lately have been time capsules. You know, oh, this is you get to see Tran and also her roommate from Yale is in that shot. And uh, and there's certain moments now that I look for that are just kind of memories and snapshots. You know, so that 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 so that so for me it just has that uh, deeper kind of personal meaning. Yeah. Just on a quick side note, and I want to end with talking about your Amazon project that's coming up because I think we need to get that out as well. Among uh, everything we've talked about, I'm not sure John realizes the the just the sheer buzz that's going to be within the Heights that's coming. I, I I don't think he understands what's coming because I feel like y'all got robbed during award season for Crazy Rich Asians. That's just my personal opinion. You don't have to say anything. Let me do the talking. I'm the one speaking here. You could be like, F yeah, in your, in your head, I don't care. But I feel you all got robbed because Crazy Rich Asians was one of the best films that year. I don't care what you tell me. And I think his time of redemption is coming. In the Heights is the best thing I've seen this year. And it's not even out yet. And people need to see it on the biggest screen possible. I, man, you and I are sharing the same mindset because it's my favorite film of the year. And it's definitely John Chu's, um, it really is his opus. And it is... I, I when when I get emotional watching the trailer a year ago and then watching the movie, he is such. I I, I get I'm so happy f it. I get choked up thinking about it because he is such a gentle spirit. He is such a collaborative, humble um, genius, and who packs so much empathy and love and just spirituality in every frame. It's like. It's like a, it's like a really, it's like a, I don't know, like a really good 
cookie where you, you like it's a homemade cookie where you, you taste every bit of love and every morsel. That's that's what John's movies are all about. Every frame is just full of love expressed in a film. And so much care goes to every shot. And he does it effortlessly. Being behind the scenes, he just is ex he's exactly who you think he is. He is just a calm presence and just a he's a casual genius and uh very approachable very easy to talk to and hang out with and uh you're right i mean it's it, i'm 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 beyond happy for him and it's uh it's my favorite movie this year so uh you know i i just beyond happy for my friend yeah he he will get his revenge this year i tell you he will revenge he will he will do it for all of you who who did not get what you deserved they gave you the ensemble, but they did not give you what you deserve that year. But we're going to move on to our final topic here because you've been we're way over time. And thank you to the people listening, because, you know, there are people listening on this because you've got thank people you. among people among people listening <laughs> to make sure I don't say something that's, you know, that's just how it is in life. Uh, let's talk about your Amazon project. Uh, you, that's a big deal. Thank I you. mean, and, and, and I'm excited to hear more about it. Uh, go right ahead. It yeah, point. it's right now. It's it's um, it's just in script phase right now. It's called Shoot the Moon. It's a dramedy um, conceived by Paul Bay, this amazing podcaster who is also of Korean descent and is loosely based on his life. And it's produced by Daniel Day Kim and his company, 3AD. That um, and we're uh, doing it for Amazon in, in script phase. And uh, right now, um, like literally, I was just looking over. We're just going over the outline, and it, it's the joy of – there's a certain joy when you're behind the scenes of developing a project, whether it comes to series or a pilot. Even if it falls short of that, I love the process of development. You, It's just fun to develop something from scratch that comes from your, you know, your life or your idea, and you collaborate with – Dr. Ken was that for me, where I created that from scratch. I you know, wrote that, conceived it, and it, and it went on for – 44 episodes, way longer than I would ever have expected. I didn't think it would even get the pilot. So, um, and those are, you, you have to adopt that mindset as a producer. You have to, sometimes you, as an actor, you go in, uh, when if you're reading for a role, you can't, you go in going, okay, you, knowing that you may not get that role, but are you doing a good job nonetheless? It's a, it's a certain psychology you have to have as an actor and as a producer. And, uh, it's so far so good where it truly uh, – it, it's so great to collaborate with people that we are of like mind and we don't have to – you know, to have an all – like right now, we're an all-Asian project, just the four of us, um, including his producer partner, John Chang. And so we – you know, it's my dream to, you know, have as much um, representation um, behind the scenes, you know, and, and in the writer's room and, and producing – um, than, than we do in, as in front of the camera. So it's kind of part of my, uh, my mission in general, not just this project, but other projects that I'm kind of developing on the scripted end. I, r I really want this to, in, in many ways, I, I'm, I'm thinking of future generations. You, you want as much representation for the screen and, um, and then behind the scenes because that's the only way you can really have any, any progress. And there's other projects that I have in the pipeline that, that I – that I really want to cultivate and whether I'm a star of it, whether I'm not, it, it doesn't matter. So I think the beauty of where I'm at in my career, it, you know, I, I don't, I don't think of myself, Oh, this is where I'm front and center. This is where I'm not front and center. I've had so many, I've had so many moments of, uh, of glory. <laughs> and, and so um, in, in many ways you can leverage that feeling of satisfaction where I'm just thinking of the collective and, and of the project because I'm equally content in terms of my on-camera ego and fulfillment, very much happy, if you look on the unscripted end, so happy to be a panelist on Mass Singer and so happy to be the host where I'm more visible on and I can see your voice. It, it's equal joy. You know, there's equal amounts of it. So, I, so w once you get that psychology out of the way, um, all you want to do is just create something, something really special. And so, um, you know, knock on wood you know, we'll just do the very best we can to see that come to fruition. 
I, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation, uh, for what you've done to get the word out about the terrible acts of violence going around America right now towards the Asian community. And so I, I thank you because you, I feel like every time you speak on it, I, I feel like I get an, educa an education. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you. I, that really means a lot to me. And, it, and to me, I keep everything as simple as possible is just to do something, whatever that is, do something. And then, and then, and then, and build off of that. Everything's additive. It's just do something and just, um, and just grow from there. So I try to keep everything as uh, kind of as simple as possible in terms and pure and in, in, in intent, and then just do something and just build from there, which really kind of sums up my whole, uh, kind of my whole, my whole essence, basically. I did something and then I just try to build off of that. And, and we all evolve, yeah. Thank you. And we've also learned that you're just a tremendous human being. We've learned that Joel McHale and Will Arnett are the worst. <laughs> Wait a minute, did I get that wrong? Did I get that wrong? Or is that just my me, me channeling that they're horrible people? No, let me look at my paper. Hold on, hold on, stand by. Oh, I got that wrong. Oh, oh, they're, they're okay. They are, they are always amazing. They, they are in, in, the, in the literature of, of comedy and the literature of storytelling, they, they, um, they aid me in, in, in helping, they put me in a position to shine. <laughs> and so in the, in the collective of it all. So we all have a verse in this song. <laughs> Ken, you're not going to convince me, man. I, they're, they're, they're okay. I'll give you that. Joel's okay. Will's okay. You're better. Team Ken. <laughs> yes, Team Ken. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much for this opportunity. I can't wait to get oh. to editing this and really making thank this you. as perfect as possible and um, getting out the word about why people should hate Joel and Will. And uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm gonna cut that part out. But I'll add the last part at least. Okay, I'm not gonna cut any of it out. I want people to hate yeah. that. <laughs>